Welcome to the You Cannot Handle the Emet podcast. Emet is Hebrew for truth. And this is a play on the old phrase, you cannot handle the truth from the movie of few good men. This is based on the fact that we call the gym Emet and our motto is your truth through sweat. My name is Nicholas Ingle and I'm your host for this podcast. I am an alcoholic and I have been sober at the time of recording this for 13 years. I set up this podcast with a view to sharing the experiences and lessons that I've gained over the last 13 years of sobriety in fighting to rebuild my life. I'm a strength coach, I'm the founder of Emmett Gyms, and now the founder of this podcast. And the reason that we have done this is for you. We are here to share lessons and experiences both my own, excuse me, both my own and those of some pretty amazing individuals that I'm fortunate enough to interview. Those who have overcome some incredible obstacles and challenges in their lives. Not just world class or top performers, but real people like you and me. So today I'm fortunate enough to be able to sit down over Zoom with an incredible human being. Oliver Nathan represented South Africa in the 2004 Paralympics in swimming. He achieved incredibly well in his division. And he, his best performance was in Butterfly, the hardest stroke. On top of that, Oli has faced some really tough challenges. He's been a member of my gym for six years and we've been fortunate enough to get to know him. In the podcast, we discuss his experience as a young man being able to represent his country and the pressures that that brought with it. And any young athlete or any parent of a young athlete should really give this a listen to because Oli comes up with some incredibly good sound and real advice. If you're wanting to know what it's like for a young person to perform at an elite level and those true pressures, you'll enjoy the show. We also talk about Ollie's other challenges and struggles in life, what he's doing now, and how he went from working for one of South Africa's top business schools to completing his MBA in two years with one of the best and most recognized university degrees in this country and in the world. I think the MBA that Oliver did is well recognized, well regarded worldwide. We get into some fun stuff talking about uh, the books that he enjoyed and his life and towards the end also the challenges that uh, the youth face today, particularly the millennials. We talk about entitlement, we talk about the damage that that does, we talk about the pressure and the damage that parenting can do to an individual when you are raised to believe that you can be anything and achieve anything. Enjoy the show, guys. Thank you for listening. It is quite long, but if you do stick it out to the end, then uh, you will basically get to hear us um, banter a little bit about millennials and the challenges of of being told you can achieve anything. Uh, that was one of the most vocal parts of the of this podcast. A quick word from our sponsor: our podcast is. Brought to you by Emmett Gyms. Yep, me. I'm sponsoring my own podcast. And uh, we will have a couple of cool specials available on our website. If you go and check that out, that's www.emmettgyms.com. You can get hold of us on our email, training at emmettgyms.com. And check out our socials, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and LinkedIn, Emmett Gyms. Thank you guys for listening and enjoy the show. Right, we're recording. So I'm just really, really grateful. Um, firstly, as you said, I have to do the voice. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. So, Ollie, um, welcome to the You Thank Can. You. Oh, sorry. I'll, well, to the You Can't Handle the Emet podcast. Sorry. Thanks so much, Nick. Thanks for having me. It's a, it's a real pleasure to be on and to be invited to be a part of it. I, um, I think the, you know, given our history, 
the greatest challenge, <laughs> I'm trying not to chuckle, that um, you and I face with this podcast is keeping it uh, that I can mark it non-explicit on the, uh, <laughs> mm. on the show. So, but, you know, I've known you for, for six years. Yeah, they're, yeah. they're about, eh? yeah. so almost through, seven. Almost seven, hey? sure. Through the oh. gym and uh, just watch your progress. I think when we met, you were looking for, you were looking for work and stuff to do and just seeing your mental toughness and your tenacity that you built, um, that you built this amazing life on, you know, just this year qualifying with your MBA, um, your, your background in terms of representing South Africa and swimming at the Olympics. And it's amazing. And the, the, the point of the show and why we put this podcast together is to have an opportunity to talk with incredible individuals such as yourself about strength about mental tenacity mental toughness grit um, and the spiritual strength emotional strength that people have inside of them already and and you know it well because you do a lot of work for people um, and and you do an amazing amount of service to communities and to individuals um, I'm, I'm trying not to blow smoke up your butt here, but like seriously, the thing that, that struck me the first couple of times I met, when anyone would walk into the gym, you would stop what you were doing and you would go and introduce yourself and greet them. And that's an amazing thing. When we get new people into the gym, you are like our automatic welcome wagon. And uh, it's something that I'm, I'm very grateful for. Mm. Thanks, Nick. Well, I mean, it's it's very kind of you to say that. Um, and and yeah, I mean, I guess I guess first up, um, I guess I want to say that anyone and everyone has the capacity for mental, spiritual, and physical strength that they probably didn't even know they had. Um, and it's really just about finding ways to kind of unlock that strength and use it to use it to our advantage and and you know everyone has that superpower in them and like any good superhero um you can either use that power for good or for bad um and i think you know the the, the emmet gyms um really provides that kind of crucible uh without providing a plug for emmet gyms but really <laughs> provides that crucible. Plug, plug away plug away it's fine <laughs> provides a crucible where you can where you can start to to, to, to fine tune yourself and develop yourself spiritually, emotionally, and physically. And I, and, and I say spiritually, emotionally, and physically in that order for a very specific reason. I think, um, you know, one of the, one of the slogans of, of the gym is that the, the mind is primary. Um, and, and, you know, that's for very good reason. Your mind is, your mind is, 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 is the race car driver and your body is just the car. Um, and, the body does what the mind uh, instructs it to do um, and the spirit and the soul is 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 really there to uh really there to 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 help you judge between what's good and what's bad and what i want for my life and what i don't want for my life and what kind of people i want around me and what kind of people i don't want around me um so yeah it's been it's been an incredible journey um you know the last seven years and um i'm always the first to it's funny how it works you know it's 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 quite ironic like yes the mind is primary but exercise is so incredibly important for the mind as well um you know exercising the body is so good for the mind and the soul uh and and everyone that i meet like i cannot i cannot um you know emphasize enough how important exercise is for a human being um, you know, we are designed to use our bodies um, and do these incredible things. Um, and exercise has been really been something that has, um, I don't know, just unlocked this, this, this part of me that, that I didn't even know existed in terms of what my body's like and, and what I'm able to use it for and what I'm able to achieve with it. And you've achieved some pretty pretty incredible things in in your lifetime and i'm not even talking about just the stuff that i make you do at the gym um mm. you know you got to you got to the highest level in in one of your chosen sports uh 
Now, Samir, if yeah. you just want to give people a little bit of a, a background and a sure. rundown on who you are, what you've done. Mm, mm. So, so I'm 35 years young. Um, I'll be turning 36 in September. And you, are, you I look know, I think magnificent, I've... Oliver. Oh, well, thank you. Magnificent. Sorry, this is, expect this banter back and forth, guys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's very kind of you, Nick. Um, so, so without, without, without boring listeners, um, I guess the first place to start is, is to, to let people know that, you know, I've, I was lucky enough and privileged enough to represent South Africa at um, the Paralympic Games in Athens uh, in 2004. Now, <clears throat> I just want to preface that story by saying that um, I'm no longer a professional swimmer. Uh, and I found other uh, other ways to kind of use my body um, in good ways. Um, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about mountain biking um, um, shortly. But, yeah, to get back to the story about swimming. So, you know, if I go right to the beginning, I think I learned to swim at probably about age two or three. Uh, and I've always been re- absolutely besotted by the water and, and absolutely besotted by swimming. Um, I think I only really started to take swimming seriously, probably probably from around age uh, eleven or twelve. Um, and you know, I joined a swimming club and I did a lot of uh, galas, club level swimming competitions, all the way from age twelve to about age fourteen or fifteen. Uh, probably around there. And then, you know, I, I got drafted into the Gauteng A squad, A swimming squad. Um, and, you know, did a range of competitions. And then I got drafted into one of the national squads. And I've been, well, first at a junior level. So I've done a range of global swimming competitions. Um, I think the one that I... What, that I remember most clearly was when I went to Australia. I think that was in 2000, no, nine, yeah, 2000, I think. Um, so I was still pretty young. Uh, and that was really, that's kind of where, where I really kind of uh, uh, broke onto the international scene as a, um, as a kind of up and coming Paralympic prospect. Um, so I swam in the, in the category S8. So how uh, uh, Paralympic sports work uh, for people with disabilities, there's different levels of ability more than different levels of disability. Uh, and you, you, you swim in a certain class of people uh, who have a similar range of ability in terms of their ability to pull themselves through the water. Um, so I swam in, in, in the S8 class. Um, and then I think from, yeah, from about 2000, I think it was quite a, quite a, a, a fast rise through the, through the ranks of, of, of uh, South African swimming. Um, and yeah, I, I, I did a range of competitions, uh, you know, in the UK, in Sheffield, in Argentina, I did two swimming competitions in Argentina, a swimming competition in Australia. Um, I've been to Australia a couple of times, yeah, Argentina a couple of times for swimming, and then I got drafted into the Paralympic squad for Athens 2004. Um, and I think, you know, finding myself in the highest leagues or levels of swimming, I think was, you know, I was only 20 years old at the time, so I probably, I didn't really feel equipped with the mental um, sort of fortitude to be able to to rise to the occasion and to 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 really achieve well i mean i I did really well, but you know i didn't achieve as I thought I was going to achieve and I think you know i mean i can't speak for everyone else, but when I was twenty years old, I mean geez, what did I know uh, about life um, about you know about having the kind of maturity that it takes. Um, to keep your feelings under control, 
uh, and to kind of modulate what you're feeling in order to allow yourself to perform. Um, and uh, sorry, I'm having a sip of my coffee. I guess, I mean, th that's an incredible, incredible amount of pressure when you don't really have sort of the skills, the life skills to deal with it. I mean, can, can you tell us a little bit about that pressure? Yeah, so I think, I mean, uh, you know, going, representing your country at, at Olympic Games, I think, was the most exciting and terrifying experience at the same time. And, and you know, hindsight is, is, is twenty twenty. So if I knew what I knew now then, things might have been quite different in terms of how, my, how I could have extended my swimming career further. Um, and, you know, I, I entered, uh, I was entered and I qualified for three races. That was the 400 meter freestyle, the 100 meter freestyle and the 100 meter butterfly. Uh, so, you know, I was a butterfly specialist. <laughs> yeah, I'm laughing. You picked the easy ones, huh? Yeah, of course. Yeah. Um, so, 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 you know, I, I trained as a butterfly specialist. And, uh, you know, the 400 meter freestyle, I didn't make it through the heat. The 100 meter freestyle, I wasn't globally competitive. But the, but the 100 meter butterfly, I was, I was a lot more competitive. So I made it through the, 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 the heats, uh, which was okay. Um, I think I placed in the heats, I think I placed about uh, seventh, sixth or seventh glo globally in the heats. Uh, then, of course, there was the semis, wow. the semifinals, mm -hmm. uh, where I placed about sixth or seventh globally as well. Uh, and then I made it into the final of the 100 meter butterfly. Uh, and my placing was sixth as well overall. So that's six out of, there's eight swimmers, generally eight swimmers in a, in a, in a race. Um, and, you know, at that level of the sport, it's just incredibly, incredibly competitive. And I think the separation between first and last is, 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 is milliseconds. And, and um, that, that comes down to usually whose mind is in the game best that day. It's not the yeah, best, it's I, the best in that moment. It's the best in that moment. And I think it's, it's, it does have to do with the preparation. So the preparation mm. and the training is what sets someone else, sets someone up to be able to perform really, really well on the day. Or maybe it gives them you know, a really good, a better, a better shot. So the best prepared is best able to take advantage of the opportunity that's presented to them. Uh, and, and, you know, I probably could have been better prepared, but, but, but I guess, you know, at age 20, maybe I didn't know what, <clears throat> didn't really know what I want. Didn't really know what I wanted. So mm. uh, I did well, um, but I decided after the Paralympic Games, that that was it. I'd had enough of swimming and I wanted to study and I wanted to do a whole bunch of things that, that you know, 20 year olds, people my age were, were, were getting up to and getting into. And there was really a lot of partying, pretty much. I felt like I'd kind of missed out a lot on like. So, I mean, your tra training was your life up until then? Pretty much. So, I mean, you know, just to give you a sense of, of you know, if anyone knows anything really about aerobic training for competition, it, it, it works on, works on a tapering system. So um, let's say about, you know, about six months out from the biggest competition of, of, of one's life, there's the training is so intense before you start tapering that training off as you start heading towards uh, a competition to allow your body to, 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 recuperate and rejuvenate itself right um it's so intense so it's like a, a, a day is like i don't know like training between 4 30 and 6 in the morning um and then of course you know i'd finished school i wasn't working mm. so i was just training um in that in that paralympic year you know so it's an hour and a half of swimming that's they call that you know six or seven kilometers in the pool um, and then then a gym session gym and or plyometric session in the middle of the day and then early evening another session a long session 
uh, probably like two hours, two to two and a half hours in the pool. Um, so, you know, at the end of the day, um, that's thousands of calories burnt. And um, yeah, it, it, it's, it's not for everyone. It takes a special kind of someone to be able to sustain that year in, year out, or the useful life of their career. But I think it, at that level, and it's time in the pool, it's not just swimming laps. It's yeah. working and refining technique where you've got to be so incredibly mentally present. I think that's the main, it's mentally exhausting before it yeah. becomes physically exhausting. 100%. So it's the, it's, 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 and it's not even, it's not even a thing of boredom. I think a lot of people who maybe go and do laps at their local gym, at their pool, at their local gym, I mean, that can be quite boring if you're just doing laps and laps and laps. Uh, you're not, pool, but you're but, not, um, you're not zoning out like the guys yeah. at the local pool. You know, it's not a mindless. Yeah, thing. very much so. So it's, so 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 the sessions are incredibly focused, and the sets of the sets of swimming exercises are very very focused. Um, and that yeah, that required real real concentration, um, and and a sort of mental fortitude that I probably didn't have at the time. And, you know, I started at the beginning of, of, of this broadcast, of this podcast, really about talk, talking about mental fortitude uh, being a capacity that is innate in all of us. And our, our job on planet Earth is to really find ways to unlock that. Mm -hmm. And so the swimming experience, as mixed an experience as it was for me, um, was a very, very important part of unlocking mental fortitude and unlocking physical fortitude in my life in general. So from that point of view, like it was an incredibly positive experience and it's important to take the long-term view. Um, you know, hindsight of course helps, but the long-term view and experience with going through real hardship um, it, it is, is, is really what kind of adds credits to your, 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 your fortitude bank. I suppose, if you want to call it that, um, experience going through really difficult times, really difficult things, and getting through the other side stronger for it. That's what grows it. I think that, that's such an incredibly valuable point. And we talk about that all the time at the gym and uh, sort of with the, the motivational work or that I do at corporates and stuff where people have to understand the difficulties that they've been through, the challenges that they've been through. It's what sets you up. You know, you it, it, every time you go through harsh times, those hard times, harsh times prepare you better for the next lot of harsh times and hard times. But as you said, you you build your your fortitude bank. I mean, that's a wonderful way, a wonderful way of putting it. I wanted to ask you because I think it's hugely important when in every single stroke that you took in that pool, the Olympics were on your mind. I mean, that's an incredible amount of weight and pressure to carry for, for someone mm. so young. Mm. If we look at, we get a lot of young sportsmen, rugby players, cricket players um, coming through the gym and training. And there's a lot of pressure on them to perform, whether that's to get a scholarship at university or make their father proud, make their family proud. There's a lot of toughness and challenge and mm. you know i've spoken to guys that i know that were like elite level uh, runners for example when they were 12 years old and there was so much pressure that they they said i'm done they, they've never run again in their lives mm. what advice just from your experience because listen it doesn't get better than the olympics what advice mm. would you give to young guys and girls that are performing at top level at school or at varsity now in terms of maybe what you feel you didn't have, but you have now, you know, what advice would you share with them? So I think, thanks, Nick. I think it's a, I think it's a, it's a great question. Um, uh, and such an important one. And I think whether other people are putting pressure on you or whether you're putting pressure on yourself, it, 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 it doesn't really matter or, you know, it, it's pressure, oh. how, however you look at it. And I think what's far more important is to understand the reasons that you're doing something and to really dig down and explore, well, what is the reason I'm actually doing this? And 
what is the reason that there's so much pressure on me? Have I put this pressure on myself? Are other people putting pressure on me? Or is there, am I in an environment that's pressurizing and I'm feeling pressured to perform? Now, I think it's, it's, it's you know, I was lucky in that my parents didn't like push me to, push me to, to perform in the pool. Um, you know, I did that all of my own accord. So yes, the pressure was there. I was putting the pressure on myself. And, you know, it's, it's in some ways, you know, competing at high levels, there is a lot of pressure just purely as a result of the fact that you, um, it's kind of like, it's kind of like the burden of success. Um, because you are successful at something, people also come to, 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 to expect that you're going to be good. So the weight of that expectation is a, is a, is a, is a, is a, you know, a form of pressure and, it's a uh, lot it's less good. pressure to be in the third rugby team than it is to be in first. Very team. much so. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Very much so. You know, because when you when you when you come first at everything, the expectation is that you're going to keep on winning. Um, hmm. and, and and really, what's so much more important is examining your motives for for, for why you're doing what you're doing. Uh, and I think you know, if you're able to do what you're doing, and honestly say to yourself, "I'm doing this because I enjoy it." Because I enjoy the challenge, whatever you enjoy about it, whether it's the challenge itself or it can be the reward, uh, you know, it doesn't really matter. Um, but you've got to ask yourself uh, that, that, that question. And I didn't ask myself that really. I didn't really examine why I was doing what I was doing. And that's why I wasn't as successful as I probably could have been by my own definition of success. Um, and it's not that I was doing swimming at that level for all the wrong reasons, but I just hadn't clearly crafted for myself a set of reasons, not justifications, reasons as to why I'm doing what I'm doing. And I think years later, I've hit upon why, certainly why I stopped. The reason why I stopped swimming is because I stopped having fun with it. The element of fun uh, and friendly competitiveness with myself mm had had kind of had kind of um had kind of gone and that's why i stopped that's why i stopped swimming i mean i'm i'm, I'm exercise mad i i, I mm. absolutely love exercise and love my body it's just that's not coming out in swimming because i don't um it's not it wasn't bringing it stopped you know somewhere along the line it stopped bringing me joy and so i had to find something else another outlet okay to express myself mm. So what would, and, and that's something I want to talk about a little bit later, but what would you, um, I don't want to use the word advice because I know you're not a big fan on advice. You, you talk to people. What would you say to a, a young athlete that is at an elite level and the fun's gone? So high school and there's a lot of pressure, but like they've got rugby, there's an opportunity maybe to go to university I mean, you know, with our academy coaches, like they've gone like from high school, school scholarship, rugby, and, and that's given them an opportunity for a future, but the fun's mm -hmm. gone. What would you, what would you say to, to that? Yeah, look, I mean, a hundred percent, Nick. And I think it's, 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 you know, I can only talk from my own experience in terms of the, you know, I'm very lucky to have access to the resources that, that I had where I, you know, I didn't have to work. I was able to, I was able to swim full time for, you know, for three years there, really, two years, really. Um, um, but again, it's like, like if if you want to look at sports and competing in a very instrumental way, as in a, as a means to an end, that well, that's fine as well. Uh, I think all I'm saying is that it's important to examine the reasons why you're doing things. Okay. Um, because it's so easy to get, just get swept up in doing things for the sake of doing them like some sort of tick box exercise. And I think that can move a person from maybe not so much from, 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 from having fun to being content because I think contentment is more important, but it can move a person from being content. Okay. I'm okay with this and I'm okay what, with what I'm doing to unhappiness. Right. Because, you know, at the end of the day, sometimes in order to get ahead in life, uh, you know, you don't have to step on, step over other people, but you do have to hustle. 
Uh, and, you know, if, if rugby is your ticket to a uh, university scholarship, then, you know, if that opportunity is presented to yourself and you've examined exactly why you're doing this and why you've, why you've chosen this route, um, then by all means, give it everything mm. and, and get your hustle on. Okay. If, if you've got someone that's the fun's gone, but they're competing, mm. What's, I mean, what's the timeline that you would say? It's like, listen, are you just, you know, is it just what you're going through currently at the moment? How long have you mm-hmm. been feeling this? How long do you stick it out? I think that's really mm. what I'm asking. So, so, so I, I don't know if you, it's, I think it's different for every person. I'm not sure if you can apply a timeline to it. Um, but I think, you know, at the end of the day, you have to, like, I have to live with myself and my decisions. Mm. So, I don't know. Something inside me just said I knew. I knew that 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 this was it for me, and I and I don't know how I knew it. It was just something that I felt. Um, and, and and you know, proof of that was trying to do swimming competitions post post the Paralympic Games in 2004. Where, right. Um, you know, I just I just wasn't feeling. I just wasn't feeling it. I wasn't feeling. You know, at first I thought it was just because I was tired from the Paralympic Games. But I just wasn't feeling it. It just wasn't for me. And I just didn't want to do it anymore. So uh, I knew. Something deep down inside of me told me. And I think for any person, you'll, you'll know eventually. You might have to just keep on pushing yourself a while for yourself to, to, for, for you to figure that out. But you will know eventually. Right. And, you know, it's interesting you say that because I see with you in the gym, Quite often, some days, most days, we will go balls to the wall and push really, really hard and give it everything that you've got. And then some days, you'll just be like, come in, do a couple of movements and just really socialize and chat and hang out and relax. <clears throat> yeah. Excuse me. And that to me, I think is, is really, that as you said, you know. So yeah. if you just talk like, there's tremendous value in that. I mean, what, what value have you found putting in the effort to get to know yourself? So, so it's been, it's been massive, Nick. I mean, uh, I think, you know, I'm one of those people cause I'm quite an A type person. So I'm a qu- you know, qu- quite, gen- sorry, what quite, 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 quite. <laughs> no. No, the, the, I think the word is the A type person. Yeah. So, so, you know, with often with A type people and, and, you know, I don't want to generalize, but for, but for me, uh, you know the the pressure that we put on ourselves to perform in whatever it is is just ridiculous yeah um so 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 the great thing about you know getting into my thirties is maybe i haven 't mellowed but i 've found opportunities to cut loose a little bit and just be myself and i don 't well, honestly i don 't want to be training like an absolute maniac every time I come to the gym there 's a very very important social aspect and I get my social nourishment from my friends at gym. Yeah. Uh, and, and, you know, I like to talk a lot. Uh, I don't know if you've noticed Nick, um, but, <laughs> but uh, that's a very, very important only, part. only when they're girls in the gym, Ali. <clears throat> of course. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, but, you know, it's, 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 it's for me, you know, and, and I think it's similar to your thinking. It's, it's not so much, now about bodily strength it's it's really about it's really about wellness as this mm. kind of holistic view on my body who i am as a person uh emotionally spiritually um financially career wise starting to look at all of those different parts of my life as 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 they just individual parts of this great this great whole that is my life mm. Um, and, you know, coming into the gym, loosening up, having a chat with the guys is, is, is as important for me, it's become as important as doing a session where you, you do focus and you work really, really hard and you're absolutely stuffed after the session. Uh, and then you saw for like two days afterwards and I'm, you know, I'm pretty fit and, and, and damn mm-hmm. strong. And some of the sessions that are very hectic, I'm still sore. Um, so, so, so it's, it's, there's a time and a place for both. And I think, you know, just because I, I might be taking it a bit easier one day, doesn't mean that I'm not committed to, uh, 
uh, to my own growth. Uh, and, you know, I take my, my socializing and my chatting as seriously as I take my training. But I think that's, that, that is part of your growth because you have balance. And I think that's, you know, that's what we all strive for or say that we strive for. But that's a yeah. good, healthy balance. It's not all in or not all in. It's just, it's, it's really amazing. I mean, and again, I don't want to blow smoke up your butt, but you do bring incredible value to the gym. And I've seen that with a lot of our other members. Like they, they, value, they value having you. Uh, training with us. I wanted to just chat to you about something else. We, you mentioned your career. I mean, I've been very fortunate to just watch you progress. Um, I suppose you attacked it with the same fervor that you do your, um, your, your, your swimming. I mean, you've just completed your MBA now through Gibbs, which is mm. not easy. I mean, that's one of our highest ranked business schools. It's one of the highest uh, in the world. So if you just maybe just want to chat a little bit about that and then sort of why the MBA, I mean, I don't know if there's anything higher in business to get other than maybe than a doctorate, but um, yeah, mm. I'm not the, I'm not the academic, so I'm going to leave that up to you. Thanks, Nick. So, so, so yeah, absolutely. It's, it's again, back to my, 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 my kind of opening point about mental fortitude. Mm. Um, that's a quality that we all possess and that can come out in different ways in different areas of our lives. So, you know, with regards to studies, I mean, I've come to love studies in the same way that I kind of loved swimming, uh, except this time around, my reasoning for why I wanted to do the, or complete the academic pursuits that I wanted to, mm. my, my, I think my, my, my reasoning was much better more, more, more clearly sort of thought out and planned out. Um, so, you know, I wanted to do an MBA because I'm really, really passionate about business and I'm really, really passionate particularly about, about small businesses and, and, and really interesting uh, entrepreneurs who, are, who have, have gone through similar struggles, although the actual nature of the, well, although the actual struggles might be different to my own, the nature of their struggle is the same. And, 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 the, and the nature of the struggle is to, is, is, is to try something out, to take some risks. And if you get knocked down, that's okay. You know, to pick yourself up, to learn whatever lessons it is that you were meant to learn to, and to carry on. Um, and, and so I get really, really passionate and really excited when, when, when people are out there doing great stuff in the business world. And I think that business um is this incredible f force for good it's like the superpower thing it can be used for good or for bad but i've seen particularly with entrepreneurs um that that i've come across i mean obviously nick and and emmet gyms included is that that Thank vital you. spark that that you know that that business Businesses can contribute to society in a very, in very, very, in very, very meaningful ways. On the one hand, but they can also contribute positively to the lives of individuals in meaningful ways. And a person can actually make a living out of positively contributing to other people's lives. And that's that's really what I'm what I'm passionate about. Uh, so I want to learn more about that process in order to be able to understand it, and of course to be able to assist people. Um, cause you know, I'm, I'm, I'm really, really big on, 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 on being of service to other people, uh, especially to the people that I love. And, um, you know, so, so, so like anything in life, there can be multiple motives for doing something. So I did an MBA because I'm, there's a kind of selfish interest of me being interested in business, but also that I want to help other people with their businesses. Um, so, you know, there can be mixed motives for doing something and that's fine. Yeah. So that's Absolutely. how I ended up, uh, doing two really grueling years of, of part-time sure. MBA studies while holding down a job, yeah. while training, while still being involved in my, in my various different, uh, 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 service commitments to the various different people that I help. Um, so yeah, it's, it's been a really, really full two years. 
I mean, you, and you, you really put in, I mean, huge effort. It was amazing that like the times that you would come to the gym and I'd be like, you know, it's very cool that you're here. And I think that that mm. goes back to the balance and, you know, w- where did you find the balance? I mean, was that a lesson from the, the so, fortitude and the toughness? Mm, mm. So, so I think, you know, I think exercise is very much my outlet for, um, yeah, no, what, the thing is, no matter what's going on in my life, whether it's work stuff, relationship stuff, whatever it is, I can come to the gym and either talk it out or train or talk it out and train or some combination thereof. And it's, 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 it's the most wonderful, uh, you know, pressure outlet because I can leave the gym feeling like it doesn't matter how crap my day has been or whatever's happened. I am almost guaranteed of leaving the gym feeling better than I did when I walked in. Um, whether that's thoroughly exhausting myself, um, that's the, the exception. Generally, the rule is that I'm going to feel invigorated after uh, a gym session. I'm going to feel physically physically good. But again, I'm going to feel mentally, um, mentally sharp. My mental acuity is going to be there after a session. And uh, spiritually, I'm going to feel invigorated and plugged into the power of the universe, whatever that is. Absolutely. So, yeah, so the power of that. I mean, gyms are, gym, especially box gyms, um, they're incredibly, incredibly powerful spaces for rejuvenation. And I don't mean that in an esoteric way at all. Uh, I mean that in a really, really holistic way. You know, it's good for my body, it's good for my mind, and it's good for my soul. Mm. And, 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 you know, the, the, the great friendships and relationships that you build with people in a small gym, I mean, that's, in my view, in my experience at least, uh, that can't be found in, in, in your bigger kind of commercial gyms. Absolutely. I mean, it's just pu- purely, I think, from a space, a space point of view. So what's, what's next on the card? So you mentioned the mountain biking and uh, putting in, so, I mean, I know you, you've often said, nope, you're going to go ride today and get out. So can you tell us a little bit about that and you know, what's, what's happening with the mountain biking side now? Yeah, absolutely, Nick. So, so I think, um, you know, I started getting into mountain biking probably about, I would say probably three, uh, three four years ago. But uh, that's kind of just riding around the, you know, the Emerentia uh, Delta Park system, which if you're not from Johannesburg, uh, that's kind of a huge kind of green uh, area, uh, open area of essentially parks and, and felt and it's, it's quite a distance um, and I kind of got into that with my brother my younger brother's uh, Elaine has, has been into uh, mountain biking for a number of years um, and I think it's just really in the last I would say in the last year that I've really started to take things really seriously so heading towards from the end of towards the end of my MBA towards the end of second year up to now I've been taking it really, really seriously uh, from a fun point of view. So I'm, I'm, you know, I'm very much a weekend warrior on the, on the mountain bike, uh, but I love putting my energy into learning a new craft and, and mountain biking, like most things uh, in life, it's really about a craft that, that, that you get better over time and, and the, the improvement is slow. Um, and, you know, you, you hit barriers and you keep on chipping away and chipping away until you break through that barrier and then you, you get onto the next level. And I've done one, one race now, which was quite cool at Cradle Moon, which is a, uh, <clears throat> a set of a network of mountain biking trails out in the, I suppose that's in the west of Johannesburg, west, northwest of Johannesburg, just outside Johannesburg, um, in the, the Cradle of Humankind area. And yeah, it's just the most fantastic, fantastic way that I've found, new way that I've found to kind of use my body um, and to be able to power myself on this machine with two wheels. It's, it's quite something. Um, and, and very importantly for me, and a really unbelievable, unexpected benefit is really getting out into nature. I mean, you know, in this country, we're absolutely blessed with incredible 
uh, incredible uh, uh, wilderness areas that are not far from Johannesburg that are, you know, 20, 30, 40 minutes drive from Johannesburg and to just get out there in the same, in the same way, and this is the great irony, in the same way is that you can go to your box gym, which is a small space to rejuvenate your mind, body, and soul. You can also go get out on your mountain bike into the great, uh, the great, literally the great outdoors, and and rejuvenate your mind, body, and soul. So it's right. been fantastic. So I think you're putting in a lot of effort into looking after yourself, into the rejuvenation, the recharging. Mm. Mm. Uh, if you could just share a little bit of um, sort of advice on that, you know, have, have you had times in your life where it hasn't been like from the swimming mm. side, you know, and mm. what were the consequences of that and, and why you keep, you keep working that now, you know, and why people should. Uh, 100% Nick. And uh, you, you know, it, it's like, I cannot stress enough. And this is something that I got wrong for so many years is, it's so important to so important to find a life um, where there's lots of different things going on. Uh, like, you know, I, I've seen a lot of people who have poured themselves and poured their lives into their work, uh, but that generally only takes them so far. Um, you know, especially if you work for a company, if you work for someone, if you have your own business, I mean, you can work at a place for 20 years and give it your all and be a great employee. And, you know, once you leave that place, you'll be very quickly forgotten about and, and replaced. So it's important. And I think for young career people, people leaving university, going into their first jobs, that it's just a job. Yes, it's important. Yes, there's bills to be paid, um, but it's just a job uh, and it's not your life. And your life is much, much bigger than the role that you have or the title that you have. Um, it's so much bigger than that. And I think, you know, there's been different times in my life where I've kind of grappled with, you know, am I my job? Am I my title? Uh, and now I don't grapple with that anymore. I'm not those things. I'm so much more. In fact, I can't describe myself in just one sentence because there isn't one sentence mm. that describes me. I do so many things. Um, and, 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 and it's really, that's really what the rich tapestry of life is. It's about, it's not so much about what I've done and what I've achieved, but, but, it's, but it's much more about who I am as a person and, and how I've managed to meaningfully contribute to other people's lives. You don't define yourself in one way as one thing. 100%. And Can I don't we, think you have yeah. to. And I think, I think there's a societal expectation uh, that we need to, I mean, I think it's slowly changing, but this idea that, you know, by, I don't know, by 20, by 25, you've got a great career that's, that's on the up, that you've, that you've got a, <laughs> that you've got a house, that you bought a house, that you, yeah. that you married or engaged that, or that you have kids, and, you know, and it's just life's just not like that at all. Uh, and I thought that's what life was going to be like like this linear progression of, of things. And it's just not like that at all. Like, like, like you've turned it sort of into a tree with all of these different branches. hundred percent. And, and, and I'm still figuring it out as I go mm. along and, and everyone doesn't matter how old or young you are is also figuring it out. So while everyone is busy figuring it out, uh, you know, the best we can do is, is, is to try and be understanding of, of other people's journey and try, try, try to be a bit empathetic. Although for someone like me, you know, empathy is not always my strongest suite, but, but, but that's something that I've, that I've made a deliberate at attempt to, to focus on is, is, is really being more empathetic towards other people. And of course, empathetic towards myself, because I actually cannot be empathetic towards other people. If I don't express empathy and self-love towards myself. 100%. So, 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 yeah, it's, it's like, it's tough to say to someone, you know, put the idea of, 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 of the sort of white picket fence and 2.5 children and career and house with, a, with a car out of your head. It's, it's difficult to say that to someone if that's what their dream is, but 
I guess what I'm saying is that life just doesn't turn out the way that we think it's going to. In fact, in many respects, it turns out a whole lot better. Absolutely. I think the more that we get a chance to live it, the the better it gets. And the problem with yeah. that, that white picket fence dream um, is that it may not be your dream. That may be the dream yeah. of your parents or some idea that you got stuck in your head of how it should be. I mean, you you through what you do for a living come across a lot of graduates uh, or you know youngsters looking to further their career. And I mean, it's, it's a lot of pressure when your firm's paying for what, for your studies and, you know, there's a big expectation and I've, I've seen it quite a bit when I got to do some work at some of the universities um, where I just set up and ran some rehab programs and addiction counseling. And we had kids coming in that were, let's say, studying law, for example, but they didn't want to be a lawyer, but their mother yeah. worked as a domestic worker and, you know, to send their child to university because he must be a lawyer and the mother's doing that so that the child, she feels that the child will be safe. She feels yeah. safe. She doesn't want her child to do what she did. She wants a better life. He must be safe and being a lawyer is a good job, mm-hmm. but it doesn't mean it's going to be happy. And, and this one guy who is stuck in my mind, he wanted to be a hip hop artist and a hip hop producer. So after a couple of sessions of chatting, we just, we had a group where people would just come and share their thoughts. I'm not a counselor. So, um, you know, he realized and we said, uh, said to him, you know, why don't you become an attorney for artists and represent them? Because you know how the industry can just chew people up and spit them out. And that was his shift. Exactly. As you said about the swimming, then it became fun again. So, you know, that's something that we face where we, we mustn't live our parents' lives. We can't because 100%. it's going to lead to resentment at the end of the day. 100%, Nick. And I think um, that's where friendships uh, and mentorship and things like that become so important mm-hmm. to be able to turn. And it is possible to turn people, um, to help people to shift their own thinking so if they're some, in something and they feel like they're compelled to do it and it's not their choice to be able to shift and help them craft that into something that is their own vision, um, I think is incredibly, incredibly important. And I think um, it's quite sad that not everyone gets that opportunity. Sometimes mm-hmm. people do things because they are they feel the pressure to do them, as we were talking about, whether it's from family or whether they put the pressure on themselves and they're miserable. Then you get other people who they have someone incredible who comes across their path and is able to kind of put that piece in the puzzle that they that they were missing. Um, not so much, you know, everyone's a whole person. Not that a part of them was missing, but maybe to help them connect the dots between what they currently have and what they want out of life. Right. Um, so you know, it's entirely possible. It's entirely possible, and I think it's. That's why, like, no person, no person is an island. It's so important to have, to have friends and people who care about you who are going to help you connect those dots. Absolutely. And I think friends and people that care about you outside of your immediate circle, people who yeah, I think absolutely. I think, I think absolutely. I think mentorship, particularly mentorship, in whatever form, whether it's business mentorship, whether it's coaching, whether it's sports or training mentorship whether it's just someone who you really look up to and consider to be your mentor if that person is outside of your immediate circle and is not subject to the same patterns of thinking as you um then all the better i think you spoke about putting a lot of pressure on yourself when you were younger and a lot you were the one who put the pressure on yourself for the swimming not your folks And then you move to balance. What helped you with that move? Because I think people can understand that they can start to do that shift. It will be hugely beneficial from pressure. And and self-pressure is the worst pressure because it's with you 24-7. You know, your parents annoy you. You can leave the house sometimes, but well, not at the moment. But that self-pressure is always with you in your head. How did you move from that to the, the amazing balance that you have? Um, 
you know, I think it was it was it was really very really hard fought, and it and it didn't come easily. I, you know, I'm so used to. In fact, you know, still now I go through bouts where I put this ridiculous pressure on myself to mm-hmm. perform whatever it is that you know that I'm that I'm currently doing. But it's really around. It it, it really came from the recognition that that putting undue pressure on myself is not long term sustainable. Um, and you know, if I'm striving for perfection, it's it's like this impossible goal. Uh, the only outcome of perfection is failure. It's impossible to meet up to these unrealistic and unrealistically high expectations that we kind of create for ourselves, and to be able to hit the mark every time. So it's 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 it's, it's what I've done is really had more of an a kind of awakening to the fact that I don't have to get everything perfect. And I actually have to fight that instinct to want to get things perfect with the full recognition that we live in an imperfect world and we are imperfect beings and that's completely okay. And, and I wish I could say there was one silver bullet uh, that helped me to, to break through that perfectionistic kind of thinking, but there, there isn't. Um, it's 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 really been um, it's really been hard fought for and ha- hard won through my experience. Uh, so you know, Winston Churchill said that if you're going through hell, just keep going. Um, and it's not always about doing the triple jump. It's sometimes it's 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 about putting one foot in front of the other, even if you have to crawl. Just so long as you, 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 you know, you don't stop moving in whatever way it is. Right. And the answers will come. The answers will come and the breakthroughs will come if we, if we just choose to continue growing. And even if that growing means that it has to happen very slowly or very quickly, and even if we have to drag ourselves there, crawl there just to not stop moving and and have faith that that you know we will improve in the sense that we will be able to achieve more balance in our lives um and it's it's if you've ever taken out a piece of paper and actually tried to plot your life plot the different aspects of your life uh it soon becomes quite easy to see where you're out of balance and if you put your life onto a pie chart it's a it's a simplification. If you are spending eighty percent of your time doing work, there's something really wrong there, in my view. Um, and if you're doing spending eighty percent of your time doing exercise without taking time to rejuvenate, uh, spend time with family, spend time with kids, whatever it is, then there's something wrong there. Um, on the same token, there, there there isn't a pie chart that's like the template for how someone should live their lives. But balance can be achieved if we are deliberate about the changes that we want to make in our, in our lives. That's uh, true. That's good. And you know, you said there isn't a template for any one's life based on the template of another's. I think uh, you spoke of a silver bullet. I mean, and, and it's not being one thing and perhaps, I mean, that silver bullet is the slow development of self-love when we start to love ourselves and start to value ourselves that's when we start to move from being unreasonably tough on ourselves to more balance and care and Mm. and self-love and self-worth because self-love i mean is the hardest thing Ever. I mean, it took me, I've I been mean, sober for coming up on 14 years. And it took me 11 years to mm. discover true self-love. 11 years of being sober. I mean, that's just, that's just crazy. Sure. Uh, you know, I think, uh, you know, self-love and self-esteem is, is something that I would say the vast majority of people actually have to grapple with. Uh, and you know, we are presented with a choice and, and, and I think the thing is to know that there is, there are various different forms of assistance we can get in order to cultivate 
uh, that self-love and to develop our self-esteem. It's, 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 you know, I wasn't aware that there was help out there in the form of various different therapeutic interventions um, that are around. But, you know, when I started to engage with that stuff in a meaningful way um, a few years ago, you know, just in my self-love and self-worth has improved tremendously, tremendously. And there's no shame in, there's no shame in, in seeking out therapeutic, psychological, psychiatric, whatever it is, help at all. Um, and I think in some ways, it's very encouraging that I think the stigma around, you know, mental illness uh, on the one hand and self-esteem and self-love, self-worth issues, the stigma is starting to slowly change as, um, as these issues start to enter the popular conscious, conscience a bit, a bit, a bit more. Um, but, you know, it goes back to what we were saying about, about people being islands. Nobody's an island. Uh, and it's okay to ask for help. Um, and Absolutely. I find myself asking for help all the time. Um, and, and that has really shown me that it's not, um, it's not an admission of, of, of weakness, asking other people for help, but actually it, it, it's, it's an expression courage. of courage. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, to have the courage to say, "Hey, I'm not okay. Help." Yeah. That is. Uh, that's the hardest point in the whole process is just having that courage to to ask. Hundred percent. Hundred percent, Nick. Um, and so, yeah, you know, you, you know, I I must be honest with you, my like I say without reservation that my life is really, really, really good. Um. And my life is, is, is really, really good today, not as the result. It's not, it's, it's not, my life is good, be, not as the result of a happy accident of the universe. My life is good because I put in the work yeah. to make it that way. Um, and life hasn't always been good. And there will be moments where I feel like my life is not all that great. Um, to know that the, the, the yeah, it's to know that the, the good times will pass as much as the bad times will pass if we prepare to put in the work. And, and, and really what life is about is kind of, you know, going back and forth and oscillating between things going well and maybe things not going so well and facing new challenges and using my experience to try and help me get through that particular challenge. But not having all the experience that I need still have to kind of muddle through and figure things out on my own, which adds more to my experience bank and helps Absolutely. me face the next set of, of challenges as they come. Um, and it's, 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 you know, there's the most fantastic author who's no longer with us. He's a psychologist by the name of M. Scott Peck. And his most famous book that he's written is called The, the Road Less Traveled. And I think very interestingly, one of the chapters in the book uh, one of the chapters in his book, The Road Less Traveled, uh, really talks about having a dedication, being dedicated to reality. And people who are dedicated to reality are able to see things as they are, I'm, to see I'm their just life. Googling it now, right? Yep. Yeah, and to see their life as it is, not as they wished it to be. Um, and being dedicated to the reality of my own life uh, means that I get to face things head on and I don't have to run away because the things that I think are scary and difficult are scary and difficult 9.9 .9 out of 10 times in my own head. So I think the key to a not so good life or an unhappy life is to be in full flight from reality. Right. Uh, and, you know, I spent a portion of my life being in full flight from reality uh, and never facing anything, um, never facing myself, never facing other people, saying what, I ha what I've had to say and doing what I had to do. Um, but really what that dedication to reality means is that I get to say what I have to say and I get to do what, what I need to do. Uh, and by facing my own darkness and facing challenges head on 
I get through them and I get through them the other side better for it. I think that's when you fight for your life, you put the work in, you put the effort in, it's empowering because if you're not working to, if you're not working for the life you want, you live the life you get. And when you live the life you get, you feel helpless, disempowered, um, you know, uh, and that's, that does, that, that helplessness, that disempowerment can, you know, that's what causes people to take their own lives or slip into depression. As you said, when it doesn't matter how bad it is, just cr- if you can't walk, crawl. You know, yeah. just keep moving forward. Keep working for your life because it's your life. It's the only life that you have. And if you don't yet yeah. have the skills, work to develop. You know, w- just working towards them is, is going to develop the skills and give you that skill set. Hundred mm, percent, mm. Nick. It's it's so important what you say. And there's, there's another idea from from psychology which is really around locus of control. So mm-hmm. my locus of control, where I have control, can either and it's really about perception of control, right? So it's my mm-hmm. locus of control can either reside within me, or I give my power away by thinking that everything else has power over me, and I'm just this victim of circumstance. The truth of the matter is, is that we're partially a victim of circumstance, but we actually have so much more power than we think we do. Uh, And, you know, I have power over my thoughts. I have power over my actions. I have power over my behavior. I have power over my beliefs. Um, It's your attitude. That's Yeah, attitude. This thing called attitude, which I'm trying to still figure out what that is. I have power of that. That's in my. That's that's within my ambit of control, and and I can use that to try and navigate my way around uh, 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 around the world and around life. Uh, and that's recognizing our own power and the responsibility that we have is really what empowerment actually looks like, uh, which is the opposite of feeling disempowered that things keep on happening to me uh and if i'm feeling like things are the way it should be 100 percent. and i think you know if i feel like things keep on happening to me and why does this keep happening to me well that's got much more to do with my attitude Mm. than it does with you know it's my perception things aren't happening to me i'm happening to things everyone faces challenges everybody faces challenges uh, and sometimes it's important to just not take that stuff so bloody personally, you know. It's so true. It's if we look at what's happening in the world at the moment. So if people are listening to it, we're smack bang in the middle of the coronavirus, COVID nineteen pandemic. I think what are we on day forty seven of lockdown here in South Africa? And I've seen I, I've actually stopped going on social media a lot because of the negativity and we we speak about attitude, I can control that. So I can control what I bring into my reality to that extent. And a lot of people are saying, well, our freedoms have been taken away and we have so much less freedom than we used to have. And I, I commented on a post this evening to say that, you know, those freedoms are, I didn't want to say, I, I had to restrain myself a bit in terms of delivering too much of what my truth is to say that, you know, the freedom's an illusion. Um, You you go back uh, into Nazi Germany, the Jewish community before Hitler came to power believed they had a degree of freedom. Uh, People, the, the, the Rwanda, the, before the, the war and the genocide, people had freedom is also at the hands of our freedom is at the hands of others. So we now have people that are in charge and they have an army and they have a police force. And you can also choose to go, okay, listen, I agree with this or not, but I'm going to listen. The freedom is in our choice and our attitude. We can't go out, fine, make the most of it. Um, you yeah. know, find, find a way to do it. But freedom, when people start talking about those, you know, these are our freedoms. 
that is a sense of entitlement and entitlement mm -hmm. is believing the way the world should be that you are entitled to be able to do these things it's not mm -hmm. because also when you become that level of that entitled you lose the well, i feel one loses the appreciation of the small things of the everyday things 100 percent, nick i mean i cannot wait I to think... get back on a beach because it's going to be yeah, the look, most incredible I mean, time. Can you imagine your next swim in the ocean? It's going to be your best ever. Yeah, 100%. I mean, yes, you know, our, our, technically our freedoms have been curtailed. Uh, but, but absolutely, I mean, I think in South Africa, and yes, it's a generalization, mm -hmm. but the, 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 the attitude of entitlement across, and mm -hmm. this cuts across all different sectors of our society, uh, the belief that we are entitled to. Um, and, and that, 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 that sense of entitlement is completely taken for granted. Uh, absolutely. It, 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 when we are entitled, when we feel we're entitled to all of these things, uh, we miss out on the little things that are so important, like to be able to wake up in the morning, uh, have a nice cup of coffee and, you know, absolutely do a gym session over zoom. Uh, and get on my bike and go for a nice ride around Joburg. It's such a beautiful city, actually, Beyond, in the absolutely, early mornings. Absolutely. And I, yeah. I, I would really encourage anyone listening to this, if you haven't been to Johannesburg, just come and see how incredible it is as a city. Mm. But I think the, the thing that worries me, because I get to see a lot of these, uh, we talk like with a lot of the youngsters and a lot of kids in, in very bad shape. Entitlement for me, and again, my, in my opinion, my, my belief is saying that you do not believe you're capable of getting it on your own. Mm, mm. I mean, I am entitled 100%. to this. It says, really, I don't believe I can just go and get it or work for it or get it done. Yeah. Very yeah. disappointing. 100%. 100%. Very, very incredibly. I mean, I think you're so right, Nick, and I haven't even really looked at it in that way before. I think entitlement is really disempowering, as you say, because it, it, it's, it's, it, it kind of severs the connection between means and ends, right? So, uh, 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 you know, the ends are what I want to achieve. The means are how I'm going to get there. But yes. with entitlement, I don't believe that I need to put in the work in order to achieve what I want to achieve or get what I want to get. Uh, I think it, it's I even worse it by virtue. Yeah, by virtue of by virtue of me just existing or being in a particular place or under a particular social or political regime. I think it's it's exact hundred percent. But even worse than that, it's not that. Uh, it's that I, I believe I'm not capable of getting it without the mm. entitlement mm. and and mm. that's terrifying I think, which is which is which is a, i think which is a, a, a virus a virus yeah. of the brain a virus of yeah. of, of, of of society that well, the, type yeah. of, of thinking the, it's yeah. it's the, the the maybe the generation now my generation the generation of parents that have raised mm. youngsters telling them they can have youngsters look how old I am. <laughs> you know that you can have anything you can be anything you can do mm. anything and there's that belief system yeah i heard uh, whether it was something i read or, or heard in a, another podcast which was which was amazing it says don't tell your children that they are clever like oh you are so clever well you you know well mm. you got it no he said you worked hard and you got it because telling yeah. someone, you're so clever means like oh okay it's automatic you know yeah. i have this you don't have the skill set you worked hard and you got it well done i'm proud of yeah. you and when we I raise understand. you know it's we, we're entitled to nothing Every person is entitled to nothing. This, the moment you feel you're entitled, you disempower yourself and you remove that belief that you're capable and you're able to get it. Absolutely. 100%, Nick. Listen, let's take a quick break. Uh, yeah. Just want to go to the loo quickly and get a cool. glass of water. With pleasure. Um, thank you. And listen, I really, I really, really appreciate your time. And now you're making me look for the rep rep pause button. Ad break. Uh, 
ad break. Yes, we'll be yeah. right back after a word from our sponsors. That's Oliver. There you go. Recording. Okay, and we are back. Ollie, you look a lot lighter and more relaxed. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah, it it has been. Uh, I mean, it is. It's nearly an hour and, and twenty minutes, um, and it's quite late. So, I really, I, I do appreciate your time. Mm. Uh, being here and sharing i think we we were talking about sort of entitlement and saying that you know we are we are entitled to to nothing and the risk yeah. of entitlement it is it it deprives of deprives us of our ability to develop that self-worth and self-love through hard work through failure and through mm. uh, not getting what we want because sometimes not that's the best thing. I mean, it's a cliche, but not getting what you want can sometimes be the greatest thing in, in your life. 100%. Uh, absolutely, Nick. Um, I couldn't agree with you more. And I think, um, you know... That's why I've got you on the show. I'm just kidding. <laughs> obviously. Yeah. Um, but, but, you know, you know I, think, I think if you grow up uh, and you are told constantly told that you deserve this that and the next thing by virtue of some quality that you have Mm. um you know you're going to go out there into the big bad world and you're going to be sorely disappointed that uh people aren't just going to give you stuff for free out there in the big bad world um you know under political political regime change or social change where the things that you might have been entitled to by virtue of that um or those benefits that mm. accrue to you as by virtue whether it's of your skin color or of your social class or whatever it is that stuff's not that stuff doesn't last you know it, it's um as soon as the as soon as the context changes changes you're going to be left um uh, uh you know, feeling bitter and resentful because you're no longer getting what you believe that you are entitled to. And that's why putting, putting, you know, putting your shoulder to the, to the wheel uh, and working for what you want to achieve is so important. And going through setbacks and hearing the words no are so important. And being denied of what you believe that you are owed is so important to break you down uh, in a good way for you to learn that you need to work um, your butt off. Yeah. Work your butt off to achieve harder than you ever thought you would. Yeah. Harder than you ever thought you were going to need to work. And the outcome is often very different from what you thought it was going to be. And very more often than not in really good ways. Absolutely. You know, and that's, and I think people who tell the youth, or tell others that they are entitled to something are doing them a huge disservice because they are giving false expectations, which makes people take their foot off the gas. You know, if you say, um, you're entitled to nothing, there are thousands of people after what you're after and yeah. that are probably smarter than you better connect. You better work your butt off from the age of yeah. four years old and develop those skills and those street smarts. When we tell people, you, so you, you're entitled to this, we're robbing them of reaching their potential. We're robbing them yeah. of enabling them to become the very best versions of who they are. Because you yeah. sit back and you wait. That, that's entitlement. It's sitting back and waiting for yeah. it to come to you instead of going out and getting it. And that's an incredible disservice because we need to we need to be able living our lives, empowering people to become the best versions of themselves. And that's through telling them the truth. It's kind of like, it's kind of like, the, uh, I suppose a good metaphor for that is to, it's kind of like sitting, waiting for a bus, but you don't have a copy of the bus schedule. Um, and <laughs> or a ticket. sitting and waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting yeah. and waiting for the bus. Um, not going and asking everyone, anyone around if there's a bus that stops here in such such a time. Yeah. Not maybe looking for another bus stop. Yeah. Um, only to only to realize that that the bus company stopped running that route about ten years ago. 
Yeah, absolutely. That's and what that, entitlement's yeah. like. That's it. And then, and you missed the job interview because of it. Yeah. And you missed the job interview. You know, that's it. It's, and I see this all the time when uh, working at, at some of the rehab centers that I do, you get these youngsters coming in from supposedly, well, now entitled, uh, you know, families and wealthy connected families, privileged backgrounds, pri- privileged are. backgrounds. And these kids are, destroyed because they've been told that they never had to work for anything. They've been told that they're entitled to a certain way of life and that bad behavior gets covered up, bad behavior gets, and then eventually it collapses. But they're like zoo animals because they've been kept in captivity and or every need has been met. And the moment they go into the wild, they get eaten and they, they don't know how to cope and how to deal. And it's heartbreaking. You know, like with with that kid who had to start washing cars, irrespective of who his family was or the wealth. But if you want pocket money, go and work for it, kid, or come to the factory, come to the business. Um, Having to work really, really hard for stuff. And and you also, you appreciate it. You value it. Very much so. You know, you you, you appreciate things much, much more when you have to work. for them and and you know there was a there was a great quote from uh from bill gates i think i'm going to see if i can find it here quickly uh let me just see bill gates i'm just googling it quickly um quote on so just while you are looking for that quote yeah, I think yeah, you got it. Right. Um, hang on, there's actually another quote. Oh, cool! Uh, not a Bill Gates quote. Yeah, Let me we, see if I can find it quickly. We get two quotes yeah. for the price of one. The, um, you know, the thing with what is your view on hard work and how hard work is portrayed in society? You know, we look at the, a lot of. Um, these entrepreneurs, so you know, entrepreneurs on the, these Facebook adverts, you know, get rich yeah. quick, make a buck quick. People, do you think the va- hard work, the value of hard work, and the reality of hard work has been lost? Um, I think it has. I mean, uh, you know, I think we're living in times of of, of instant gratification, or at least the, the the illusion of instant gratification. I mean, with the globally interconnected world that we live in, I think it's it's so much easier to get things so much quicker whether that's information uh goods services i mean we, we are we become really really accustomed to achieving things and getting things at the click literally at the click of a mouse um but i just wanted to read this, mm. this quote to you which is one of my favorites nick um and it's written by a guy called uh calvin coolidge and it says that nothing in this world can take the place of persistence. Talent will not. Nothing is more common than unsuccessful men with talent. Genius will not. Unrewarded genius is almost a proverb. Education will not. The world is full of educated derelicts. Persistence and determination alone are omnipotent. The slogan, press on, has solved and always will solve the problems of the human race. Sure. There you go. Beautiful. That's um, awful. Yeah, that's in the opening of the movie The Founder. Um, okay. The founder of McDonald's. So and it just it's very it's that's it. Persistence, tenacity, the desire not to quit. That's thank you for sharing. That that was awesome. Sure. Um, you know, when we get the chalkboard back in the gym, that's going up on the chalkboard. But, yeah, uh, it's a cool we'll, one. Yeah, it's a very we'll get, cool one. We'll get one of the girls to write it because we both have shocking handwriting. Uh, Absolutely. Ha- handwriting like with it, like this, like mine, I should have been entitled to go to medical school. Um, <laughs> telling you, Nick. mine too. <laughs> <laughs> That's an amazing, also a wonderful, wonderful quote. Ollie, just, I think in, in closing, I mean, it's quite late and I don't want to take more of your time. Two things that I wanted to say, uh, well, mm. say, and then, then a question. Firstly, um, I know that we have spoken about it before. You know, you're, you have a lot of wisdom and experience to share and you have a very calming way of doing that. So I think you really, if it's something that you want to do, 
uh, just look again, starting, you know, speaking, mm. corporate speaking events. There are a lot of people that can benefit from what you've been through, both in the sporting arena, because you have performed and achieved at the highest possible level in academia. That's, you know, you're, that's as, as good as it gets your, your MBA, really, without mm. becoming, you know, full-time academic. So you should really, you know, look at that. When you write your book, I'm I'm going to request that you come on here to launch it. And, uh, Thanks, you know, you. I'm going to have to fight Oprah and Leno. I don't know if, <laughs> even if they still work. I don't know. I'm old. Um, you, you have know, to fight fight Jerry Springer, Nick. Jerry Springer. They're Jerry. Uh, yes. <laughs> Jerry. Jerry. From, you mean Jerry, Jerry from Springs? Yes. Jerry from Springs <laughs> on that. But I, I, what I just wanted to sort of ask, I mean, your, your thoughts that you would like to to leave the, those who have had the courage to listen to the entire show. Firstly, we say thank you. But uh, for those that have uh, listened, I mean, your thoughts just on mental toughness and you know, strength in mental strength, physical and emotional strength. Yeah. Um, I think there's, 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 there's two things I want to do. I want to, I really want to find that, that, that Bill Gates uh, quote quickly. But uh, let me quickly find the quote and then I'll wrap up uh, what I want to say next. So right, perfect. Awesome. And you can also you can just, fire it off to me and I'll drop it in the, in the show notes as well afterwards. Yeah. Groovy. But yeah, that, that Calvin Coolidge, uh, th- there's a lot of wisdom out there. Other than the, um, the book that you, that you spoke about, The Road Less Traveled, are there any other books that, uh, that you would recommend for people to read? Um, so that M. that M. Scott Peck book that I was talking about, the road less traveled. Yes, uh, absolutely brilliant read. Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. Um, and and it's available on Audible, which is the way I like to consume media because every time I read, uh, it reminds me of of being at school and made to feel stupid because of mm. my dyslexia. Sorry, or feeling mm. stupid. No one made me feel stupid, and it's available mm. for twenty one dollars and twenty seven cents. That's yeah, US yeah. dollars, not Zimbabwean dollars or Hong Kong. <laughs> yeah. Cool. 100%. So, any, so, other so, um, any other books? Any other books? No, I'm not going to suggest any other books at this stage. Perhaps when we do another, another podcast. Uh, Absolutely. Give people a sense of what I'm reading. Um, well, we know what you've been uh, reading for the last two years. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. I've been reading textbooks, and I'm yeah. and I'm not going to prescribe any of those for for, for, our, for our wonderful listeners, Nick. Yeah, <laughs> definitely if you, not. If you want to, if you want to rock yourself to sleep. Yeah. Yes. What's the best sleeping textbook to read? <laughs> yeah, uh, I think that, that's that's cor- corporate finance, Nick. Okay. Oh yeah. Oh, now you talk. Hands down. Yep. Absolutely. <laughs> you know that's uh, yeah. Yeah, having spent 15 years in insurance and then now uh, having run yeah. the gym for the past 11 years, mm. I still seem mm. to be stuck in, in the, in the financial services space with all of our corporate clients. So yeah, corporate yeah. finance, now you're talking. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I found a similar, a similar quote by Bill Gates. It's not the exact one that I was looking for, but, but I think I'm going to use it to just wrap up. And he says that success is a lousy teacher. It seduces smart people into thinking they can't lose. Um, and I think that's incredibly powerful. And, and, and I think the message that I want to bring home, uh, just to wrap us up, is that failure is, 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 is more than okay. In fact, it's an incredibly important, uh, vitally important tool to show ourselves that A, we are human, and B, that we need to learn. Uh, and there are incredibly important lessons in failure. Uh, and, you know, tying it back to a business example, there are stacks of entrepreneurs, and I think it's uh, Steve Jobs included, mm. uh, who's not interested. He, at the time, he wasn't interested on ta- in, in, in taking on people that hadn't at least run one or two of their own startups into the ground, and it failed dismally. Right. Uh, because those people, those people had learned to pick themselves back up um, and try again with a new set of ideas, uh, to try and be successful. And 
success is not a good teacher. Failure is is is, is a really mm. good teacher. And like with so many things in life, we cannot even get to enjoy success if we haven't tasted failure. Uh, in the same way is that we cannot experience love unless we have experienced hate, disdain, uh, and dislike. Um, and, and that's another element of balance um, that I think, you know, that I've tried to bring into my life is that is, is, is the balance of, of, of feelings and the balance of forces that happen in my life. I cannot experience unbelievable, uh, incredible, exciting, joy inspiring things without having experienced the complete opposite of those. So rather than trying to run away from failure and run away from difficult and uncomfortable feelings, what I've tried to do is really embrace those uh, as hard as it may be. Uh, because those difficult, hard, challenging feelings are just as much a part of life as the good, feel good stuff is. They're not outside of life. They're very much part of the same thing. Uh, and to be able to feel and to be able to process what we're feeling, no matter how difficult that might be, is really what it means to be a human being. Sure, absolutely. So, yeah, so, 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 you know, not one for deep, deep, meaningful messages, but, but you just but, got quite uh, deep there. I hope to say. <laughs> it was, yeah, it was, um, yeah, it wasn't quite Oprah you, level, you, but uh, you, you are quite, you are quite deep, Ollie, and, uh, Thanks, Nick. pretty <laughs> profound and meaningful. No, I mean that seriously. Uh, no, no, no. You know, that's you know, I remember I had a teacher many years ago and I asked her, uh, Ruth Mazaro, and I said to her, Would you rather learn something the easy way or the hard way? And to my shock, she said, The hard way. And I was like, Yeah, why? I was about seven, eight years old, 10 years old, and she said, Because when you learn something the hard way, you appreciate it. Yeah. And I think the quality of life comes from the appreciation that we have. And when we talk about failure, for me, I don't believe in failure. I just believe in getting an outcome I wasn't expecting or didn't want. And that's a, yeah. it's, it's just, it's skills for the next level, for the next step. You know, you 100%. know that every lap you didn't make in time, you understood what your stroke was and then until you get to that next one. So it's a very wonderful lesson that, that you're leaving the the audience with is that life is hard and your failure is there to prepare you for the next step. hundred percent. And, 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 you know, I suppose attached to that Nick is to not be so vain to believe that people actually really care because nine out of 10 people that you meet don't really care about yeah. you. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, it's all on you. So, so we have one life. Um, you know, and, and we need to do, we need to make the most of that life because everyone else is so preoccupied with doing that for their own lives. So you may as well get on with your life. I mean, uh, that's a the, whole other the right show. reasons. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's a whole other show. Nick. You know, where, where people are not, show. yeah, people, we, people are so worried what others think, but what they don't realize is everyone else is so worried what others think that they're thinking about yeah. what you're thinking about them, not about you. So yeah, hundred percent. Ollie, thank you, man. Really, yeah. I appreciate it, and uh, we're gonna do this again for sure. Um, we will, Nick. And it'll also be fun to get one or two um, guests and do a do a dual interview because I'd love to get your perspective on that side as well. So I just want to say thank you very much, Ollie, for your time. I know you're thank you, Nick. busy. Mm. And it, it means a lot, man. It's just well, I've got a cycle. I've got a cycle time. tomorrow, at, starting at quarter past five, quarter past Whoa. six. So okay. Uh, it's going to be quite an early start, quite a cold start, but mm. I'm doing the thing that I love to do, not because it's easy, but because, but because it's hard. Yeah. Are you starting on your, are you riding there on your bike or are you dropping it in the car and then going? No, yeah, I'll put my bike in, I'll put my bike uh, on my bike rack and then I'll mm. go link up with my brother okay. and we'll go for a ride, ride around Fantastic. the suburbs. Awesome. Yeah. Enjoy, man. Yeah. Thank you. And uh, by the way, you said you will not be leaving your house until we're allowed to, which is at 6 a.m. Obviously. <laughs> by the time you read, by the time you're watching this podcast, yeah, yeah. we'll be allowed to uh, do these uh, things the legally. Cycle. Thank you. Yeah, yes. Well, I mean, it is already the 23rd of October. 
Yeah. <laughs> exactly. What are you? Okay, my brother. Thank you so much. Uh,